Okay. So welcome to class. If you are new or visiting or a guest, uh, this is Lee Potts. My name is Jody Vickery. Lee's one of our elders. I'm our preaching minister. And we are conducting a combined adult class called God's Good Design for Manhood and Womanhood. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, we've done three lessons so far. This is lesson number four. And we are looking at one of the most difficult, controversial, strange, and complicated passages in the New Testament. Uh, you may have questions. And if you do, there are two ways you could submit those. You could write them on one of these cards that are in the lobbies. Feel free to get up and move about the cabin during flight. Um, or you can... Uh, just take a picture, put your camera on that uh, little QR code right there, and uh, it'll take you to a website. And there's a, at the bottom of the list, there's a place to submit questions. You do not have to include your name to do that. The next time we do a question and answer session will be Wednesday, May 11th. That'll be the next time, Wednesday, May 11th at 6.30. So that's what we are doing. I am glad you're here. Let's, uh, I, I think our goal today is for everybody to leave offended. That's... That's the goal today. So it's a little odd that you're sitting to my right because normally you're to the left of me. <laughs> no, no, no. You're exactly where you should be. Normally I like dad jokes, but. <laughs> you're, exactly, you're exactly where you should be. All right. Let's have a prayer. Holy Father, thank you for our time together this morning. Thank you for your word. Help us to focus on avoiding labels like conservative and liberal. And let's just be biblical. That's what we want to do, Father, to submit to your word and let it be the guide for everything we do in church, in life. Uh, thank you for these folks, and I uh, pray that you will bless uh, Pots and me, that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, you found an interesting story that kind of gets us into what we're going to talk about today. I've never heard this before. Yeah, so, so we're all familiar with uh, kind of the phrase a day of rest. It comes from the Sabbath observance. And I think we know that the Sabbath was a really, really big deal uh, for the Jews. Um, it mattered to them. It is, it is birthed out of what we looked at uh, in Genesis 2, where at the very beginning of that chapter, it, it, says, it basically says that in six days God did the work, in the seventh he rested. Um, in, in Exodus 31, Moses is going to begin to codify the meaning of the Sabbath, and he's going to tell us that, that the people are to observe a Sabbath as a reminder of God's created work. And because God rested on the Sabbath, he calls his people to rest, both as a way of refreshing our tired bodies and as a way of recognizing his goodness in creation and trusting his provision in creation. So I can take a day off knowing I'm not going to starve because God's going to take care of me. But we, we've got a problem because we know that the Sabbath tells us that I'm not really supposed to work uh, that's what it means. But the Bible never defines what work is for us. And for people like me who like very clear definitions, that can be a bit of a conundrum. How do I know whether I'm good or not? And so as people are prone to do, we begin to build fences around this idea of the Sabbath. It's understandable. In, in Exodus 15, a, a guy goes out on the Sabbath and he picks up some sticks, presumably to make a fire. He's toting it around and he gets stoned for it. So this is probably a law I don't want to go too far outside. But, but coming out of that understanding, one of the ways that we begin to define this idea of Sabbath is um, work is carrying stuff. So if I tote stuff, I'm working. Now that creates problems too, because how do I set the table? I, presumably I'm going to eat on the Sabbath. How do I tote the dishes from the cabinet to the table? I've got another problem I've got to deal with. So then we get this idea of, okay, there's a distinction between our interior living space and our exterior space. And so, so it's okay for me to take the keys out of the door lock and set them on a table. 
but it's not okay for me to take those keys, put them in my pocket, and go to synagogue because that's carrying the keys. So one of the ways we work around this is observant Jews, when they go to synagogue, will either leave their doors unlocked or put their keys on a chain and wear it around their necks as jewelry because jewelry is clothing and you wear clothing, you don't carry clothing. So on a chain on my neck is fine, in a pocket is not. But again, we're a little bit stuck. You would not think, sitting here, that a family picnic in the park on a Saturday makes me a Sabbath breaker. But somebody's got to carry the picnic basket. And what happens when the little one gets tired? Somebody's got to carry her. So you have this idea, but let me go back into this public and private space, because... This is where the story becomes interesting because what the Jews did is they established Arabs. And an Arab is just a communal living space. It's where E R U V. It is indeed. Arab. Yeah. Keep going. So you have this communal living space. And originally, an Arab is a complex of three or four houses that are joined together by an exterior wall. Because if I've got an exterior wall, I've just made all of that private living spaces. So now I can carry my picnic basket from my house into the courtyard of that private living space and not be a Sabbath breaker. Or if we're out of eggs, I can go to the neighbor's house, get the eggs, carry those eggs back to my house and make an omelet without breaking the Sabbath because I'm inside my private walled in space. And this idea opens up even greater possibilities because at the end of the day, what's a wall? It's a post with some kind of barrier between the posts. You got a series of posts and some kind of barriers. If you think about it, that sounds a lot like telephone poles. They are posts with some kind of barrier between them. So on the screen is a picture of the Yale Arif. It, it's in Yale, in New Haven, Connecticut. And everything inside that, yellow, that, that kind of white area there is communal living space. The entire area is surrounded by telephone poles with wires on them. And if you have two telephone poles coming into that that branch off in different directions, well, we just join them with some fishing line and we maintain the enclosure. I have a wall. And so now I've got 375 square blocks of New Haven, Connecticut that is personal living space that allows me to lock my doors when I go to synagogue or to have a picnic in the park. And, and we laugh at that. It seems silly. But it comes from a good place, doesn't it? I don't want to violate God's law. I want to honor what God has established. Let me suggest to you that we in the churches of Christ have not been immune from the kind of thinking that leads to the establishment of arrows. We have taken good principles like, like headship and authority, and we've set rules and, and established boundaries around them that take us from a good command, honor the Sabbath, to a whole bunch of rules that at the end of the day may not make a lot of sense and may not align with the spirit and the intent of the original requirement. So I, I think what we're going to see here is as we dive into this text, it's going to ask some questions of us. As Paul writes 1 Corinthians 11 through, through about 14, he's going to give us some examples of, of women doing things in church that we haven't allowed women to do. And so one of the questions we're going to have to ask is, have we erected walls that Paul didn't ask us to? Now, one of the other questions we're going to have to ask of the text, because Paul makes very, very clear some gender-based distinctions in these texts. So, so while this week we're really going to explore this idea of have we put up walls that Paul didn't ask us to, next week we're kind of going to dive into the idea of, well, if, we've, if we put up walls where maybe we shouldn't have, we've probably also let a few walls fall into decay that Paul says and the Bible says are good and right and true and should be maintained. So with all that says... Jody, what do you see going on in 1 Corinthians 11 through 14? Well, it's a, a, a whole section there um, that all, 11 through 14 all go together. And it all focuses on what's going on in the Corinthian, the, the church at Corinth in their worship services. Um, and there's a lot going on there. Uh, in chapter 11, 
Paul has got some real issues with some things like how they are dressing and how they're wearing their hair. And it's, it's really weird and so outside our cultural habits that it's going to take some hard work to figure out what's going on there. And even then, we'll have to hold those conclusions provisionally because it's just so different. But anyway, something weird is going on in the Corinthian worship service that has to do with how they wear their hair, how they wear their clothes. And the first part of chapter 11, we'll deal with that this morning. Uh, and then in the last half of chapter 11, there are some abuses going on with the Lord's Supper. We won't get into that today, but that's some really important teaching that we'll get into another time. Chapter 12, it's still about worship. And here Paul is reminding them of where their spiritual gifts come from. And they're using these spiritual gifts in worship. He says they come from the Spirit of God, and he reminds them of what they're for. They are to build up the church. And Paul uses this word edify a lot in these chapters. It's a word that comes from the architectural world that has to do with designing and building a house or a building. And he says, I want you to, ed whatever you do with your spiritual gifts, I want you to edify. I want you to build up the church. And then in chapter 13, that's Paul's magnum opus on love. And it's, uh, we talked about this recently when we looked at 1 Corinthians 13. I think we did it in a class and in a sermon series that we forget that it has a context. You know, love is patient and kind and all those other neat things about love. Well, Paul puts that right in the middle of all this rigmarole that's going on with their worship services. He says, let's talk about the best spiritual gift of all, and that's love. And you guys need to love each other instead of competing with each other and instead of trying to outdo each other. And then in chapter 14, there are three groups of people that are causing trouble in the Corinthian worship services. People who are speaking in tongues. That's languages that they've never studied or some kind of ecstatic heavenly language. Prophets who are prophesying several of them at one time. And then women. Some, some women are doing something that, that's messing up the worship service. And so Paul tells all three of those groups to be silent. The tongue speakers, the prophets, and the women. And we will get into that. So, uh, Potts, before we get in, where, where are we going today? Yeah, I think, I think we're going to see two things in the text today. It's going to, it's going to challenge those who had blurred the distinctions between men and women. God has given those distinctions as a good gift. And it, as we talked about in Lessons 1 and 2, is an expression of God's own character. Um, and, and so it's going to challenge those who would blur those distinctions. But it's also going to challenge those who would take those distinctions... And, and create in them some kind of artificial barrier between men and women and, and prohibit women from doing things that the Bible clearly portrays them as doing and as God ordained and, and a blessing to the, to the church. So, and that's probably going to make everybody mad because nobody's going to get their way. Uh, but, but sometimes the text does that to us and it, and it asks us to conform ourselves to the text, not force the text to conform to us. Okay, I like that. Let's read the text. I'm going to borrow your Bible uh, because okay. I don't have an English Standard Version Bible. I, well, have, I have all the others. There will be a recall vote. <clears throat> um, but uh, I've got the NIV. I've got it on my computer, but I don't have it here. So, uh, from the, uh, and I like the English Standard on this one a lot, and you'll see why. Well, we'll talk about why. So, 1 Corinthians 11, I'm going to start in verse 1. Be imitators of me, Paul writes, as I am of Christ. Now... I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought, you with me so far? For a man ought not cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority 
on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you? Boy, here's a passage I heard when I was a kid growing up in the 60s. Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practices, nor do the churches of God. Potts, Paul has a headache. He does, but, <laughs> but it, it seems that... Um... In, in God's good providence, you did learn that lesson about long hair. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I did. <laughs> so, so this idea of, of headship, this talk about head, is absolutely huge. And because Paul is going to use it to describe the relationship between men and women in the church. And his argument is that relationship should respect the created order. In the text, Paul's going to draw a parallel between how Christ relates to the Father and how men and women relate to one another in the church. And he builds the, that relationship around this idea of being the head. Now, there's a lot of disagreement about what head means. The Greek word is kephale. Um, uh, Osborne, who's a commentator in this area, points out that uh, this, this, that word appears nine times here. For those, it, it's pretty clear that it's just talking about a physical head. Um, you know, we're talking about putting, a, putting something on your head or, or wearing long hair on your head. Um, but five of them are metaphorical, and it's that metaphorical use that causes all kinds of consternation. There, there are essentially three interpretations of what kafale mean. Um, some would say kafale here has a connotation of authority. We're talking about a, a positional thing. I mean, positional probably isn't a great word, but there, there, is a, there is a sense in which the head exercises authority over the body. Others would say, no, it's, it doesn't mean authority, it means source. And that, uh, you know, it, even in this text, Paul's going to say that women come from, from man, referring back to Genesis 1 and 2. Um, and, and then the third is just preeminence, who, who's got the, the preeminent position, if you will. So I think in this text, the, the meaning it, that is most clear and makes the most sense is it carries with it this idea of authority, and here's why. So in verse 3, we have this headship talk. Then in verse 4 through 7, there's this long discussion about head coverings and how that relates to headship. Uh, and in those verses, Paul's going to give a couple reasons for why he wants women in the, in the church there at, at Corinth to, to, to wear some kind of symbol on their head. Uh, he's going to say that because man is the glory of God and woman is the glory of man. And then he's going to say that there, there's the fact, that the historical fact, that God created Adam first and then Eve second. And having given those reasons, he says this in verse 10. That's why a woman should have a symbol of authority on her head. So Paul is very clearly here talking about authority. He's saying that, that, that it's about an authority in the church. He, he uses that specific word in verse 10. And so his argument goes something like this, that the head of a woman is man. Therefore, a woman should have a symbol of authority on her head. Uh, and I know there's a ton of questions about head coverings and how that relates. We'll, we'll just, we're going to get to that later in the, in the discussion, but we'll set it aside for now and just say as, a, as we look at this text, I think the context of the text makes it pretty clear that one of Paul's controlling thoughts is the right honoring of authority structures within the church. You, you remember a couple of weeks ago, I, or maybe it was last week, I said that one question we need to ask ourselves is, what do I want the text to say? Because that uncovers your bias, and you've got, everybody's got one. When we come to any passage, we have a thing we want it to say. I really wanted head, kafale here, to mean source. Because you get further down into the passage, he does talk about the fact that, that woman came from man. That's a source issue. And then now every man comes from woman. Again, a source mm -hmm. issue. I wanted, I wanted head here to mean source because that took authority out of it for me. And I, I kind of resist that a little bit. Um, but it can't, you can't, it can't mean that. Because if, if the word head here 
just means source, then that makes verse 3 say that God, that, that, that God created Jesus, that God created Christ, that Christ is not co-eternal with the Father, God of very God, of the same essence. And, you know, Hebrews 1.3 says the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Uh, the Council of Nicaea dealt with that heresy that God created Christ back in 325 A.D. So the, the word head here has to mean uh, authority or preeminence in some way. It can't mean source as much as I want it to mean that. There is another textual complication here as well. Actually, there's a bunch of them, but the other one has to do with the difference between the NIV and the ESV. It's the one time that I like the ESV better. The, the NIV translates it, uh, I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is man. But the ESV says the head of every man is Christ and the head of the wife is man or husband. So what do you do with that? Yeah, there's a, there's a characteristic in the Greek which is just less precise than we would want it and we're accustomed to it in English. In, in the Greek, the, the word for man and husband is the same word. There is no differentiation. The same is true for the, for the word for woman and wife. It's the exact same word, gune. Uh, and so, so the only way to determine whether the text is talking about just generic men and women or husbands and wives is contextual. Um, and, and the hard part about 1 Corinthians 11 is, is we look at, at 1 Corinthians 11 and, and work our way through even verse 14 is that I, I've not gotten to a place where the, where the context comes down definitively on either side. Um, I, I could make the argument that here Paul is very, very clearly, and, and it's a good argument, he's, he's talking about people in the church, how the church conducts himself. And obviously not every woman in that assembly is married. And so he, he's probably talking about just the generic relationship between men and women in that church and how that, how that works itself out. So that might incline one to read men and women here as, as the NIV reads. Uh, but then we do have the, the contextual fact that later in verse 14, Paul is very, very clearly going to argue or, or make the point that, that his use there very clearly says husbands and wives. There's, there's no way to get around that. So you go, do you go with the near application of the context he's talking about, or do you go to the, the, how he uses that term in 14? Um, there's a little bit of ambiguity in how we sort that out, but at the end of the day, the, the underlying principle that Paul is going to underline here is that just as Christ is under the headship of the Father, he says, so men are under the headship of Christ, and as the church conducts itself, I want wives or women to be under the headship of husbands or men. I think um, I don't necessarily disagree with that. Um, I think that's responsible. Um, it's possible to read it either way. I lean toward husband and wife in these verses uh, because otherwise um, it becomes an issue where men can say all, you, you say all women are, su are, are to be in submission mm -hmm. to all men. Yeah. Um, the, the only man my wife is in submission to is me. Well, in the, in the elders of this church, which everybody in this church, male, female, boy, girl, preacher, uh, we're all in submission to our elders. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 calls us to be in submission to our elders and, and to submit to their authority uh, as those who rule over us in such a way that their work becomes a joy, not a burden. And so in that sense, all the women and all, all the men in this church are submissive to that group of men. I well, am. In, in that sense, certainly I as an elder am sub, in submission to the elders. Which is the wisdom of scripture yep. because yep. It's, it's never one dude in charge of the whole thing. It's a group of right. shepherds that hold each other accountable and, and they don't always agree on everything, but they work together to, to reach conclusions. Um, my, my sense is that he's talking to husbands and wives here. I think that makes the most sense when we get to chapter 14 as well, and we'll get there in sure. just a minute. Um, so, okay, let's assume, Potts, that somebody comes up with some genetic engineering and I'm able to go under a glow light and grow my hair long and flowing. Much like a Chia pet. Much like a Chia pet. <laughs> According to Paul, it would be a shame for me to have long hair. 
So um, I, I like Craig Bloomberg's commentary on 1 Corinthians. He, he, he says it this way. He says, most interpreters agree that one timeless principle from the passage is that Christians should not try to blur all distinctions between the sexes. Christianity recognizes that God created men and women as sexual beings with sexual differences. And those differences, I'm kind of closing the quote on Bloomberg here, work themselves out in, in, in our physical appearance and how we present ourselves. So all this talk of long hair can be really, really confusing to us because we don't live in the culture that Paul lived. We live in a very, very different culture. And, and we're inclined to ask questions just like, just like you just asked. So if, I, if I'm a guy with long hair, am I sinning? Am I doing wrong? If I'm a lady with short hair, am I doing wrong? I'm, every woman in here can say that, am I right about that? Yes, I'm not wearing a hat today, so am I doing something wrong by being here in my current state of dress? And, and what, I, what I would say to that is Paul is giving us a timeless and enduring biblical principle. Conduct yourself in church in a way that recognizing is and honors God-given authority structures in the church that are rooted in the created order. And then he's given us a very, very specific cultural application. That cultural application relates to how the culture in first century Corinth related to one another and distinguished male and female in appropriate ways. And Jody wouldn't let me use the analogy I want to use, so I'll have to use something else. Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> So, so, so let's, let's do a couple concrete analogies because I do understand that when we say something like that, folks can get the feeling that, well, you're just, you're just picking and choosing what you're going to obey, what, what's going to be culturally conditioned and we don't have to do it anymore and what's going to be an eternal command of God that is binding on us. It, let's just set this scenario up. Every, every single mom and dad in this audience with, with a daughter is going to have the modesty conversation. And, and if you are working to structure your household in a manner that honors God and encouraging your daughter to dress modestly, you, you may decide that there are limits to how high the bottoms can go and how low the top can go when you, go, when you select swimwear for your daughter. And, and that's some boundaries that you've set. So maybe it's not a string bikini, maybe it's a tankini when you go to the beach. And that's acceptable on family vacations, but a, a very small bikini is not. And, and that same family is going to have that daughter come down the stairs to go to a date, and they're going to say, uh-uh, go back upstairs. Bottoms are too high and tops are too low. Cover up. Even though you know that what she's wearing on that date or to go out to her friends with Target covers way more square inches than what you let her wear on the beach. Now, are you being inconsistent with that kid? No. You're recognizing that target and school and a date is not the beach. You have an enduring command. We are going to dress modestly in this household that you have culturally conditioned on whether we're going to the beach or whether we're going to school. And, and, and we understand that instinctively, and that's what Paul is doing here. And he does it all the time. Let's go over to 2 Corinthians 13, 11 through 12. Here's what the text says. He says, finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, what is the enduring principle that Paul is, is imposing upon us? Paul is commanding us to do. He says, you Christians at Twickenham Church of Christ, find a way to live together in peace, to comfort one another. And, and, he, and to, as he writes to the church at Corinth, he gives them a culturally specific application that greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, let me ask you. If you roll into church today and the elders are standing by the door and we're planting one on everybody, is that going to make us comfortable or peaceful? It, it, it's absolutely going to generate discomfort rather than comfort. I assure you, most of all for your elders, we are not going to want to do that. And, and so what, what Paul does is he gives us this general principle that we're to obey throughout all time in all churches. Honor the authority structures that God has given you and that are evident in the created order. 
And then to the people at at Corinth, he's saying, and this is how it works out in your situation. And to Twickenham, he says, honor the authority structures that God has given you and that are evidence in the created order and work out what that honoring of male headship looks like in your own cultural context. Okay, so um, we're running short on time here because we got still got to get to chapter 14. To summarize, though, in their corporate worship services, the Corinthians are ignoring or blurring or minimizing distinctions between male and female. It has something to do with how they wore their hair. There's a sense that women were literally letting their hair down. Some commentators say that. And that in their culture sent a signal of sexual availability, and that was dishonoring their husbands and they were doing it in church. So they were behaving provocatively, basically, is what the, the sense of the, the passage is. And Paul's saying, you guys need to stop that. Mm-hmm. Um, so anything else that we want to add to, to any of this? Well, I would probably say there's one thing. Paul's made kind of a big deal about man being created first <clears> and, uh, and, and, and this distinction between men and women. He's gone so far as to say that, you know, man is the glory of God, woman is the glory uh, of man. Um, but Paul recognizes that fallen as we are, that may puff some of us up and, and give us and create in us a tendency to say our women are less than. That, that hey, I'm, I'm made in the image of God and you're, you're my glory, not God's glory. And, and so Paul combats that. He, he goes immediately uh, as he looks at that in, in verses 11 and 12. He's going to remind us that while Eve did come from Adam, every one of you dudes since then has come from a lady. So don't get, don't get too proud of yourself. Uh, and, and he really, really clearly emphasizes the equal dignity there um, and, and says, don't, don't take this in a, way you, in a direction you shouldn't take it. This doesn't, doesn't talk about dignity, worth, or essence. Just as Eve came from Adam, so every one of you dudes come from a lady. So don't, don't, get, don't get, be wearing too big of pants. So we come, and you'll notice that we didn't even deal with uh, verse 10 where it says, because of the angels. If you would like answers to that question... Lincoln Smith has done a a lot of work on that, so talk to him. We come to this passage, we ask lots and lots of questions about this. Does this passage want to ask us some questions? Yeah, I I think when we get caught up in all the discussion about head coverings and hair length and stuff, we're we're tempted to miss something that's really, really clear in this passage. You know, as as Paul writes this, he, he starts with this idea of commending them for doing the things he taught them to do. And then he describes how women are praying and prophesying in the church as they do in all the churches. So so this text really, really asks us a simple question. Why have we prohibited women from doing something that Paul encouraged them to do? And yet, in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul seems to prohibit women from doing precisely what he seems to permit them to do in chapter 11. So in chapter 11, they are praying and prophesying in church, and he's not worried about the fact that they, that they are doing it. It's how they are doing it, right? Mm-hmm. But in chapter 14, in verse 34, he says, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. So I see about six questions in that one verse in chapter 14. Who are these women? What are they doing? And and what's Paul's solution to it? Why does Paul prohibit what they are doing? What's the meaning of silent there in verse 34? It's also in a couple of other verses. Mm -hmm. What law says they must be in submission? And doesn't this contradict what Paul just said three chapters earlier? Chapter 11, the women are praying and prophesying. He's fine with that they are doing it, just not how they are doing it. But now he says, you know what? Just be quiet. Don't say a word. But I, I think it's probably helpful just to start with a basic, you know, biblical interpretation principle. And, that, and that's that scripture is not going to contradict itself. If, if ultimately God is the single author of scripture and God is of one mind that is unchanging and cannot lie, we can trust what it says. So when we, when we see texts that feel like they're bumping up against each other, it, it, the problem is with me and how I'm reading those texts, not with the text itself. 
Um, I think it's also fair to say that, that as Paul was midway through chapter 13, he didn't go get a cup of coffee, and then by the time he got back, he forgot what he wrote in 11 and had no idea that he said women can, <laughs> women can pray and prophesy. So Paul, but I don't think Paul is contradicting himself. Um, and and so, so that's the first thing to say, that whatever f- chapter 14 says about women being silent, what it's not saying is they, they have to be absolutely wordless. Um, because, you, because praying and prophesying are speech acts. They require audible speech. Um, and so you ask what the law says. What is this law that says they must be in submission? Um, so the Jews have a threefold division of, of what we call our Old, Divi- Old Testament, the law, the prophets, and the writings. The, the writings being Psalms and the wisdom literature. And, and the law is the Torah, the first five books in the Bible. And I think we can be really, really sure that that's exactly what Paul is referring to. And one way we can be sure of this is if you look up at verse 27, he says, in the law it is written, and then he quotes from Isaiah's quote of Deuteronomy 29, 28, 49. And so Paul earlier in the same context specifically quotes a quote of, of the Torah. And so we're talking about the Jewish law. Now, we, we can't identify, I can't identify a very specific text that Paul is referring to here, but rather what I think he has in mind is, is exactly what we tried to unpack in our second lesson, that, that, the, that the creation story in Genesis 1 and 2 shows a general pattern of creation that inclines men to exercise a loving, humble leadership and women to submit to that leadership. And, and, and as I read the text, that seems to be in concert with Paul's thoughts, say, in 1 Timothy 2, where he grounds his admonition for women not to teach or have authority over men over, in the created order. Um, so so from, from a quick standpoint, that, that kind of understanding I see is tying really, really well with what we just read in chapter 11, where Paul goes back again to the created order for this idea of authority, uh, but still allows women to have an active role in the, you know, what we would call the Sunday morning service. Okay. My take on this chapter 14 business here is that the women, whomever they are, are not the first people to be silenced in 1 Corinthians 14. Um, Apparently the Corinthian worship services were a three-ring circus. Um, Everybody was speaking and singing and praying and prophesying and questioning all simultaneously. In, In verse 28, and it's important for you to look at this if you have your passage, your Bible's open. In verse 28, Paul tells those who are speaking in tongues, and this is either language that they've never studied or some kind of heavenly ecstatic language. We can argue about that another time. He tells them to be silent, and the word he uses is segato, okay? Uh, that means total absence of sound. If, if an interpreter is not present, tongue speakers, be silent. Then in verse 28, uh, I'm sorry, uh, then in verse 30, he tells those who are prophesying to be segato, to be silent, if another prophet is speaking. In other words, you guys don't need to be speaking at the same time. Then in verse 34, he uses the exact same word, segato, again, for women. So it's not just women, he tells, to be quiet here. It's, it's people who are disrupting the service. And the silence is not based on gender. It's based on circumstances. It's, it's what's happening in the service. It's not whether it's a male speaking or a female speaking. It's, who, it, 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 it's what's going on in the service that, that he wants them, the reason he wants them to be quiet. So it seems clear to me that what's going on here is that wives, because remember woman can mean wife or wife or woman. Uh, it seems clear to me that, that women, that wives, were asking questions out loud in the middle of the service. That's clear because in in verse 35, Paul says that they want to inquire about something, they should ask their husbands at home. That tells me that it was wives who were asking the questions. And and Paul says, if you got something you want to say to your husband, do it at home. This would be like Lisa standing up in the middle of of one of my sermons and going, where did you get that crazy idea? (laughs) She never says that here. I, I get a look every now and then, 
And a lot of people like to watch her watch me when I preach because it's kind of funny sometimes. So there was something like that going on in the Corinthian services where a wife would stand up and challenge another man or challenge her husband. And so Paul says, look, that's, that's not going to work very well for you. That doesn't work well. Don't do that. Paul, one of the things he's really worried about in, the, in this section, and you'll see it come up several times in, in 11 through 14, he's worried about how outsiders think about the church. And if an outsider comes in and sees you guys doing this kind of stuff, they're going to think you're nuts and they won't come back. So don't do that kind of stuff. Okay, so um, Paul does not contradict himself. And again, I totally agree with Potts on this. If my interpretation of one passage puts that passage in contradiction with another passage, then I'm wrong about one or the other or both. Paul permits audible praying and prophesying in chapter 11 if it's done the right way. Done appropriately, praying and prophesying by a woman does not violate headship. In chapter 14, he's telling wives, perhaps the wives of the men who are prophesying, to stop disrupting the service and take those questions. Y'all want to have that fight? Have it at home inside your place, not here in church. So that's me. You got anything else? Sure. Here's my take on 1 Corinthians 11. Paul wants both men and women to pray and prophesy in the church, but he wants it done in a way that edifies the church and pleases God. So he provides an enduring command. Um, Do it in a way that honors the created order, that honors male headship. And then he gives us a culturally specific application with all this discussion about hair length and, and head coverings. Um, and, but, but the text does leave us with a question that, that we as a body are going to have to answer. If, if Paul approved of women praying and prophesying in the church, then what basis do we have to prohibit it? Um, and, and, and that's where things are going to get really, really hard. And I, I'll just share you know, where I'm at personally with that. Because I have, I have grown up in the churches of Christ and I have never gone to a Sunday morning service where a woman has led the opening or closing prayer or anything in between. And so the first time that happens, I expect the sound of a woman's voice leading an open prayer to be somewhat uncomfortable because it's new, it's different, it butts up against 50 some odd years of what I've been taught is right, good, and true. Um, But at the end of the day, the text always must triumph over tradition. And so if it makes me uncomfortable, well, then what I need to do is put my big boy pants on and obey the text because that's what obedience looks like. That's my take. So it could be that we have erected some walls that Scripture does not erect. It could be. I never heard my mother pray. I know she prayed, but I'd never heard her voice. And I didn't hear my sister pray at the dinner table until we were grown adults and my father had passed away. I think I missed out on something important because of that. Amen. Let's say a prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Help us to have the courage to obey it even when it is uncomfortable. God, help us to obey your word even when we disagree with it because you are God and we are not. In Jesus' name, amen. Take a break and then we'll get back to uh, our worship time in just a few minutes.